a lot. So we're going to dive into that after a quick five minutes with today's Money Bomb winner, who brought up another interesting conspiratorial threat in the music industry that also jives with the talk I had with Mr. Gates. So I'm going to stop wasting your time and play this little spot with Jeremy, the winner of $421, along with our other Money Bomb winner this round. Definitely donate to the Higher Side Chats for your chance to be the winner of the next round, which has already started, and I am going to be getting serious with Mr. Gates on the other side. All right, people, I'm here with Jeremy, another Money Bomb winner for this round, another $421. Jeremy, man, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. I'm doing excellent this evening, Greg. Thanks for donating, and congrats, man. I'm glad you could win. Yeah, I'm totally stoked. Like, uh, when I got got your email, it just, like, totally made my day. I'd had a few synchronistic things happen that day, and, uh, yeah, I just got back, and my mind was blown, so thank you so much. Right on, man. You're not the first to say that uh, this money bomb has coordinated with other synchronicities. But where are you from, man? What do you do? So um, I'm in uh, Seattle, Washington. Been here for about a decade. Uh, totally love it out here. Um, spend my uh, weekdays working in the uh, video game industry. And, oh, nice. Um, yeah, and, and then when I'm uh, at home, I spend uh, just as much time with my uh, wife and two kids as possible. And I uh, spend a lot of time playing banjo and drums as well. Nice. Very cool. So, you know, when, whenever someone wins these things, I usually like to ask them a little bit about the show. I mean, what do you have a favorite guest or favorite topic? Have you been listening for a while? I've been listening for about a year. Um, it was actually the uh, first podcast I ever listened to. I sort of oh. like, was like, all right, I want to listen to a podcast. And so I, you know, spent a few hours searching around and I was like, oh, this looks really interesting. And I've been hooked ever since. I, you know, I'm, I'm refreshing every couple of days waiting for the next. So, oh, wow, uh, man. Yeah, it's awesome. Keep up the great work. Thank you. But let me warn you, they don't all give you $400, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A um, couple of uh, – I, I jotted down a couple of my favorite episodes. Um, yeah. I particularly loved uh, Dave Asprey. Uh, that was kind of an interesting one, and I, I picked up on his podcast now as well. Um Lynn and Honor is another one that stood out that I yeah. um, uh, also like being a father. Some of the things that he was saying just really hit home. So I thought that was really great. It, um, David Seaman was another really good one that I thought. Um, and Jordan Maxwell. And then just the latest episode with um, uh, not John Perkins. Robert but the, Morningstar. Uh, yes, Robert Morningstar. I just finished listening to that one. And uh, it, that was great. Space is of uh, great interest to me. Um, you know, sort of conspiracy around food and like banking are definitely of high interest to me. And so, uh, yeah, but I, I really love it all. But those are kind of the things that stood out to me. Yeah, man, I, I need to do a show, another one on GMOs and that kind of stuff, because it's been a while. But it's sometimes it's hard to find the right guest for that kind of thing, because uh, a lot of people have some weird opinions. And I, I want to get someone that's credible, you know, and there's a lot of yeah. snake oil in that field. So it gets tough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Energy. I, I also love that topic, too. I've sort of been fascinated by Nikola Tesla and I've heard you um, reference him quite a bit. So I, I really love that. I've been reading into Nikola Tesla for a while. So I think that's great. His sort of just that kind of intrigue around him and his relations to the banking industry and the whole thing is just really fascinating. It is. Yeah, it's it's a wild story. The whole world could have been different. But um, another thing I like yeah. to ask people, man, is do you have any uh, guests that you like, any researchers out there that you like that I should get that haven't been on the show yet? So I, you know, I, I thought about that and uh, I couldn't think of a single person, but I did come up with a couple of topics, maybe just food for thought. Yeah. Um, uh, I heard about a theory, and I just started to read into it a little bit from a friend where he was talking about um, in, in music, there's A440 that we use now. And then there's um, back, I think, uh, before the Nazis, um, they were using A432. And so there's a theory, basically, that the Nazis changed the you know sort of standard tuning that's used nowadays to kind of create inharmonious vibrations that actually, uh, you know, are not healing. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of fascinated by that. And uh, I just kind of started to scratch the surface, but that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was one thing that I thought of. I was like, wow, that's something I, when I heard about it, I was really surprised. 
Yeah, I have not looked into that much, but I have heard whispers about this, a similar thing with radio, any kind of radio frequencies or certain vibrations, any kind of electronic fog that's going out there. They seem to, There's a, some people say that they put it out at a off level from the way the human brain resonates. So there's definitely yeah. some weird stuff there. So one last big question for you, man. You know, the, the, the money bomb is made up of the people's donations. So I always like to give the people a hint at what the winner might use the money for if they've gotten time to think about it what do you think man any plans for the money absolutely yeah i've had i've had a couple days to think about it and you know it's funny it's like the first thing that hit was like oh wow what should i do and then i kind of start creeping in i'm like well i like how you reference it as the people's money and so i started thinking well what would the people want me to do (laughs) um and so i'm definitely i'm thinking i'm going to gift half of it back to the money bomb Wow. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's totally worth it. I, you know, I want you to keep doing what you're doing. And so I think that's terrific. Um, w- with the uh, rest of it, I have been wanting to purchase a conspiracy as well for a bit, um, particularly the squid of power tea. Um, so I'm going to be picking that up. And then <laughs> right when I got your news, actually, I was thinking about going to this concert. Uh, There's this jazz drummer, Jeff Hamilton, that I really love. And I was like, nah, I don't know, it's 30 bucks. I don't know if I should go. <laughs> I got your email. I was like, fuck it i'm going (laughs) all right so so yeah very cool man well you know don't don't give me back too much you know just like the the other person who won in this round they wanted to do that too and i'm like you know when the universe gives you a gift you should uh further yourself in some way i appreciate it i got my portion yeah totally well, I'll, I'll keep thinking on that but that's kind of my uh gut thought so (laughs) for sure man and i i do appreciate it that's really great that the uh, other winner said the same thing. That's terrific. Right on, man. Well, I, I, I su- I'm, I'm super happy I got to talk to you, Jeremy. You seem like a great guy. I'm glad the money could go to you, and uh, I'm glad Jeff, Jeff Hamilton's going to have another fan in those seats. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> right on. All right, man. Well, take care of yourself. All right, you too, Greg. All right, people, as we continue to comb through the flowing locks of the elite's occult symbolism, we realize that what we see today in Hollywood movies, corporate logos, national landmarks, music videos, city names, and nearly all aspects of modern culture is largely rooted in the most ancient of ancient cultures. For motivations, I still don't fully understand. And today's guest, Mr. Gates, is a comedian, entertainer, and host of the Hater Ozzy podcast, but he's done a heavy amount of research and work to peel back as many layers of the Illuminati onion as one can do without being on the inside. He's put most of this research into the shadowy elite in an audiobook series called Jupiter. I've had the pleasure of hearing parts one and two, and I'm so psyched to have him here to talk about it. Mr. Gates, my man, how the hell are you? Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, it's a real pleasure. I, I love what I've heard from the Jupiter series so far. It's entertaining. It's well produced. Uh, but most importantly, man, it's chock full of information about what the symbols we see really represent. And I think it's great. But I'm sure some people are wondering where the name comes from. So why call the series about the Illuminati Jupiter? Well, if you look into the ancient world, um, you know, at a time before... You know, before mankind really knew much, you know, if we go back to the beginning of recorded history, yeah. back to the uh, Fertile Crescent, you know, if you lived at that time, you could affect anything on the planet. You know, if you wanted to grow, you know, uh, fruits, plants, if you wanted to get this tree out of your way, you could chop it down. But the one thing that ancient men couldn't affect was the the, the heavens, the sky. You know, they couldn't stop it from raining. They couldn't stop it from a tornado that couldn't stop, you know, they couldn't stop these things. Yeah. So they just attributed to it, it to something greater than them. And they called them God or gods. Um, if you, if you look at the original religions, okay, going all the way back to Babylon uh, and, and, and going back to Samaria, even you will see that there's um, although these gods and goddesses change names, they're usually the same celestial bodies. And the two, Celestial bodies that keep coming up are Saturn and Jupiter, uh, hence the name Jupiter. Yeah, man, and it's kind of weird because modern culture has programmed us to look at these old polytheistic religions and all this uh, astrology stuff as primitive. Like, oh, they didn't understand science, so they worshipped the planets and the stars like a bunch of ignorant primitives. But yet these same groups who have the power to inject that type of mindset into the culture are the same people that are secretly paying homage to it. It almost seems like 
I don't know, like a pointless superstition or holding to a, onto a rabbit's foot for good luck. I mean, do you think there's some type of esoteric power behind their use of these symbols today, or are they just paying homage? That's something that that still that I still haven't gotten to the bottom of. You know, all the research I've done, you know, looking into this stuff. That why, <laughs> you know, that's right. the question that. Ways. You know, why the same things? You know, why is, are, do we find the same symbolism, the same goddess, gods and goddesses uh, throughout the old and new world? Yeah, I, you know, I, don't, I, I really don't have an answer for it. <laughs> no. no worries, man. But it's something I like to ask all the researchers that are on this track. But the why seems to elude everybody. But I think it's interesting because these elites are masters of manipulation. So if you think of it as like a superstitious thing or some type of worship, say like the Catholic religion, which they built as a mind control machine, why would the elite masters of these tricks be paying homage to these archetypes in the same ways? Unless there's some type of deeper meaning. Yeah, it, like you said, it's just a mystery. I don't know why they use it um, other than the fact that these are, you know, archetypal images that go way back, even further than recorded history. We find these same drawings of stars and planet systems predating, you know, recorded history, you know, on, on rock drawings or, or cave drawings or something. It's weird. I mean, they're they're powerful people, so something they're doing is working. But uh, one example I really liked in Jupiter was your breakdown of Jay Z's "On to the Next One." It was a big song yeah. a couple of years ago. I'm sure people are familiar with it. Had a really cryptic music video, and you break it down in a way that shows he's talking about the changing in the ages of the zodiac. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah. If you if you look at that video, first of all, that was the first music video released in the year 2010. He released it right at midnight to ensure that it would be just that. Huh. And if you really look at the video, it, it, you know, if you just look at it just for entertainment purposes, it seemingly has nothing to do with the lyrics. You know, right. it's, it's this black and white video. It's got some pretty cool clips and some strange imagery and symbolism in there. And it doesn't have anything to do with the, the song. But if you understand uh, this symbolism, you know, as, as, as that we're discussing, it makes all the sense in the world. On to the next one means on from one age to the other. And uh, I, I think he makes it pretty clear, or at least the director makes it pretty clear in the video. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It Like, there's a lot of stuff in there in the lyrics that you point out. Um, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, um, if you, even if you look at the Bible, if you look at the Bible, it's chock full of astrological references. Uh, you know, when Jesus tells his disciples to go to the house and follow the man with the pitcher of water, he's basically telling them, uh, once you leave the age of Pisces, you go into the age of Aquarius. Because as we know, Aquarius is personified by um, a man with the pitcher of water. And of course, lately, we, you know, we've we, more, you know, more of this has been coming out on, you know, YouTube videos. And um, there was the uh, the documentary, uh, what, what you, you know, documentary I'm talking about where they, they talked about the Zodiac and, and its relation to the biblical stories. Uh, uh, the uh, first Zeitgeist? Big. Zeitgeist, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And, and, you know, so more and more people are starting to, you know, get in on this knowledge. But if you look at the Bible, it's, it's chock full of astrological references. It's yeah. just that, of course, these were translated from Greek and and Latin, you know, so uh, some of the words might not mean the same to us in today's English, you know. So we just, you know, and if, you t if you're a literalist and you take the Bible literally, then it's just a bunch of words that don't make sense together. Right. And... Uh... I just I just like your take on these things, man, because so many of these YouTube researchers that are putting out these analysis of these music videos, they they all are just focusing on that it's anti-Christian. And a lot of it is. But then they just label it as Satanism. And they're really just dealing with the first layer of many because they're stuck from that Christian's perspective, which is more just mental programming. So when you take it out of the Christian context, I think you get a much better understanding. Yeah, yeah. When 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 you're coming from the Christian perspective or any religious perspective, it's so much. You're already coming in with the us versus them mentality, so it's easy just to say, "Well, that's Satanism. That's bad. That's bad." But they they never explain why it's bad. Like like we take the pentagram for example. That's the five pointed star within the circle. 
um, as we know, Anton LaVey used this for his Church of Satan symbolism, and it's an old pagan sign. Um, but if you look at the origin of the pentagram, it's not scary at all. You know, it represents the planet Venus and the five points uh, that she makes as she travels through the night sky and within a circle of the zodiac. And, uh, you know, when you, but when, you, when you put it through the Christian scope, you can just call it Satanism. You don't have to explain the origin. You don't have to explain why this, you know, this symbol has been carried throughout the ages up to now. You just say, call it Satanism. And that's it. Call it a day. So I, yeah, I think the, yeah. the the theorists that come from that angle are are lost before they even start. I hear you, man. And I know you've also looked a lot into the Illuminati influence on rap culture and hip hop culture. And it's definitely super pervasive in that style of music. But do you have any idea why it's so much in black culture in terms of music and not necessarily in like rock or country? Um. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you if you look at hip hop, okay, hip hop, just just the the if you look at the the bars and the way rap, you know, music is constructed, it's constructed identical to nursery rhymes. Nursery rhymes are the very first tools of teaching small children for a reason. You know, you teach them in you know bump 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 because it 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 penetrates the subconscious much easier okay and if you look into magical lore uh and you look at witches incantations they were done in the same form and the chants and whatnot um hip-hop goes directly to the subconscious much easier it's much easier to picture what the the singer is saying uh it's, it's less complex than you know than a, a rock tune or even an r&b tune you know, so it, it's a great tool for programming. And this is why you see a lot of uh, multinational corporations using this music in their advertisement because it sticks, you know, to the mind much easier. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I talked to Professor Griff once and he kind of alluded to that, too. It's weird the way music actually affects people and to think of it on that subconscious level. Uh, it's not something people do every day. They don't really think about that. But the people who are making the music, people who are behind the scenes, they're definitely having that in mind when they put some of this stuff out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, music is the only thing that every single single culture, no matter how far you go back, no matter where they were on the planet, what race they were, what language they spoke, the one thing they all had in common was music. Uh, music is one of the first languages that infants understand. Uh, they've done tests with infants where they would play a certain piece of classical music uh, while the child was in the womb. You know, they would put the headphones directly up to the uh, the stomach of the mother. Then they would bring these children back six months later after they were born, uh, you know, hook their brains up to the, the neuro imaging machine and then play certain music uh, for the child. But when they played the one uh, complex classical piece that they were exposed to while they were in the womb, their brains light up. And the very same parts of the brains that light up are the same parts of the brain that we use for speech and understanding speech. They took it a step further with these little six month infants and they put a bad note in this complex piece of classical music and the brain, according to the brains of the infant, he or she was still able to recognize that that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so uh, music uh, is intimately connected to uh, human growth and development, especially when it comes to language and therefore communication. Yeah, man. And uh, in terms of programming using music, another place you'll see that is the movie A Clockwork Orange, which is a Stanley mm -hmm. Kubrick movie, which oh. I did have uh, a couple of questions about him, because in the Jupiter material, you talk about 2001 A Space Odyssey and... I've had a couple of guests who've done some super interesting work with Stanley Kubrick and his disclosure through his films and his secret society connections, but I had never heard the point about the book and the movie uh, being written at the same time. And in the movie, they're trying to get to Jupiter, but in the book, they're trying to get to Saturn. And yeah. we see it again, the weird dual homage to these two planets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you'll see that again and again when you look for it. 
you know, uh, whether you're looking at the Bible, whether you're looking at uh, Greek, Egyptian or uh, Roman mythology, you'll see these same planets coming up and again, you know, uh, up again and again. If you look into uh, the ancient Hebrew religion, originally their their god was called El, and El was the uh, personification of the planet Saturn. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until Rome got a hold of uh, you know all of this, uh, you know, who, who's you know their top god was Jupiter, um, that they switched it, made Saturn Satan, the devil, and Jupiter is uh, the heavenly father that many still will worship today. Yeah. And when you think of Saturn as L and you get the elite, it's only makes sense that the elite Absolutely. are following L or Sa- or Saturn, you know? Absolutely. Even if you, when you look at the Holy Bible and you look at all of the names of the archangels and many names of the important players in the Bible, they all have the L in it. Whether we're talking about the angel Michael, whether we're talking it, Ezekiel, whether we're talking uh, Azrael, you know, there's the L is in there. And and this Mm -hmm. is a representation of followers of Saturn, who the original Hebrew people were uh, worshippers of. Yeah, it's trippy how it's all flipped like that. And uh, another interesting point I've heard you make that I hadn't thought much of before is that Uh, is in terms of movie programming or predictive programming, a huge number of movies in the 90s, early 2000s had black presidents. And the weird thing you start to think about is that they were predictively programming us, getting us ready to accept a black president. I thought that was pretty interesting, man. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, And if you watch films today, you'll still see it. Like, I won't be surprised if we have a zombie outbreak in the next 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, dude. uh, Honestly, exactly. uh, Another weird element to that is uh, I I live here in San Diego and a nearby military base. It was all over the news a while ago, all over the Internet, that they actually did a training exercise where soldiers were shooting zombies. And everybody was like, why? You know, why are you making that simulation? That makes no sense. And then when you look at uh, the larger conspiracy world where they talk about false flag attacks, almost everyone that's happened in modern times is going on with a live drill. So then you're like, wow, that is kind of scary. Why are you doing drills with zombies? What are you working on? Hey, you know, like I said, I won't be surprised if in the next few years there's some kind of virus or something, something pops up that just... Uh, you know, give zombie like effects to the to the afflicted. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I hopefully it won't be like the movies where, you know, their arms are falling off and they're just, you know, want your brains. <laughs> but again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if something goes down because they're, they're investing way too much money and time into it. And, and it could just be a trend. You know, we see trends. True. But Hollywood doesn't do much without some kind of motive. Exactly. Yeah. And you got to try to extrapolate what they're doing and try to piece it together and try to figure out where they're going. And that's kind of the, the, the fun, really, of diving into all this material, at least to me, is trying to extrapolate, you know, some, a future trend. But with the uh, black that's... president thing, I, I just thought that was really eye opening. I mean, it really suggests that the planning was almost decades before it actually happened, which is kind of a scary revelation. Well, absolutely. I mean, we they already know who the president is. Gonna, they know who the president is going to be in 2040 already. I mean, he's in high school right now. He's getting ready. <laughs> you know, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's Obama. Yeah, he didn't just come out of the woodworks. I mean, this guy is documented to be blood related to the Bush family, blood related to Kennedy, blood. Rela- I mean, he's part of the bloodline. You yeah. know, the the uh, the the elect, you know, the elections are just a, a ritual. It's a, it's a ritual. <laughs> to right. gauge where the, the public mindset is at. Now, I, I do want to add on to something you asked me earlier, and I, we, we got broken up. Yeah. Um, you asked me about hip hop and why it would be used um, the way it is uh, by the elite. Um, as I mentioned, you know, hip hop is, is a very dynamic form of music that goes directly to the subconscious and it's very easy to program a young, impressionable mind through it. Now, one of the biggest fears of the United States government has always been an uprising by its black citizens because of the obvious history and and, um, injustices that have been done 
uh, to people of color in this country. Um, we saw this in the 1960s where uh, people were just tired of it. You know, black people were tired and, and you, you, get, you had groups like the Black Panthers and the Symbionese Liberation Army mm -hmm. coming up against the government, ready to take up arms and fight. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the Black Panthers were highly organized throughout the country. You had two street gangs, Bloods and Crips, who were just small little street gangs in Los Angeles. Yet the FBI was able to uh, quell a group as organized as the Black Panthers, but they weren't able to stop these two street gangs that have since spread the world over. Um, in the 1990s, 1992, as a matter of fact, uh, hip hop was different before that. You know, hip hop, you know, there was some gangster rap in there, but there was some party rap in there, but a large majority of the most popular hip hop at the time was very conscious. And uh, this way you had your public enemy, uh, Professor Griffin, his guys, uh, you had groups like X Clan. You had uh, uh, groups like uh, Paris, rappers like Paris, and and they were on this. Uh, they were basically a resurgence of the 1960s Black Power era, you know. So and, and I, I was a kid at this time, so I was very influenced by this. I was I had my Africa medallion and you know my you know you know Black Power, you know this that and the other. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the rappers had always been warning the establishment about was an uprise. They're like, listen, we're going to get tired of this shit sooner or later, and we're going to tear this motherfucker apart. <laughs> and again, this has always been a fear of the federal government. I mean, the FBI was created solely to bring down Marcus Garvey. Only after that did they start going after other foreigners like the Italians and the Irish. Um, so in the 1990s, you, you have this resurgence of this black power and they're using music to do this. So, you know, back in the 60s, at least if you weren't in the vicinity of Malcolm X's microphone, the government didn't have to worry about you hearing his message. But now you have this music through a tape. A kid in North Dakota can get a message from a black power rapper from New York, you know. So it became a real concern for the federal government. And the the King riots of 1992, April 29th, uh, where they just destroyed Los Angeles. Suddenly, you had Bloods and Crips coming together, you know, all over. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Las Vegas, where I live, Bloods and Crips were coming together and saying, you know what, we have a common enemy. What are we fighting for? This scared the shit out of somebody up there, because you'll recognize that is the same year that Death Row Records got its start. Snoop Dogg came out of nowhere. And uh, hip hop has never come back since. It has stayed in this gangster era ever since. And wow. there's a reason, you know? Yeah. Uh, the black, I mean, you make a Black Power album today, it's not going to sell, you know? Um, or I any, any positive, any positive message is not going to sell, you know? Right. And, and this, this is problematic. Well, you know, it's kind of funny you bring that up because, you know, my girlfriend and I, we both theorize and speculate about these kind of things uh because you know i do the show like this and we got the new song happy coming out it's like the biggest song every everywhere pharrell's happy and uh -huh. i i think about programming and i'm like with all the work you've done to make rap about about uh you know murder and titties and drugs why are you letting out a song like happy because it seems so positive absolutely because he's rich. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, that's fair. You know, I, I had a friend who said the exact same thing you just said. Yeah. yeah. It was like, you know, how is he, you know, he, he got rich making money with the clips and, you know, you know, all this gangster stuff. How is he going to make this song? You know, it, it's, you know, but um, we, we got to look at the fact that people change, people mature. Mm -hmm. Now, what we need to sit back and wait and see is what he's going to do afterwards. You know, like is, is he is he going to go right back to that gangster stuff? Is he going to be producing more of this stuff or has he really changed? You know, they're, they're, you know, we could be just be witnessing the change that he's going through for the better. But so we just have to wait and see. Yeah. I mean, I look at kind of from the perspective of gatekeepers, you know, the, the real people who are pulling the puppet strings. And it's like it's interesting that they would allow that to become so popular, to be in all their corporate commercials, to be on Jimmy Fallon one night and then Jimmy Kimmel the next night and they're just throwing it everywhere and it's like are is is something changing are there some elites back there who actually want to program positivity I mean as far out as that seems it's like it makes me slightly hopeful I don't know 
Well, no, I mean, I, I doubt, I really doubt that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I, that's I, too optimistic. Would, yeah, I think it would be more of a pacification method. You know, that's like, regardless of all the horrible shit we're doing to you, how the banks are fucking you over, how the, uh, you know, all these wars going on, you're happy. Just be happy. You know, <laughs> it goes back to that, that THX 1138. Be happy. <laughs> you know, they're there yeah. commanding you. Just shut up. Be happy. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. And uh, I'm looking something up real quick because it was interesting that I was I was listening to you break down onto the next one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I love doing this kind of thing. I would like to get in the forefront of of trying to decode some of this music because it's just it's just a fun puzzle and i was like you know what was jay-z's last song and then i'm thinking of that holy grail song and when <clears throat> justin timberlake does the intro to that song it's like the same kind of message as uh thinking of happy as a pacifier because he says you take the clothes off my back and i let you you steal the food right out of my mouth and i watch you eat it i still don't know why why i love you so much and then <clears throat> In the background, there's a really strange, like a really weird voice that says, "Thanks for warning me. Thanks for warning me." And then it says, uh, "You curse my name, in spite, and put me to shame. Hang my laundry in the streets, dirty or clean. Give it up for fame, but I still don't know why. Why I love you so much." And I'm just like, that is almost like Justin Timberlake is talking from the perspective of the common person. And, you know, it's like, I know I'm getting abused, but I'm still, I still love you. You know, I still look to you for, for help. I still help Jay-Z sell a million records, even though he doesn't give a fuck about me. Absolutely. I, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, you know, he's not singing about a girl, you know? Right, right. I mean, the song's called Holy Grail, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Jay, Jay is on some deeper shit. Like, uh, um, I, I still haven't figured that dude all the way out. Um, but he's definitely plugged into something uh, a little bit deeper than your average rapper. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I think yeah. he makes it pretty clear. Well, you know, you mentioned Death Row Records earlier, and I was talking to our mutual friend Rob from Conspiracy HQ, and he told me I had to ask you about Tupac because I wasn't really big into hip hop or rap during that time of Biggie and Tupac, but obviously a lot of people have given their own conspiratorial take on their deaths. And some people, of course, say that Tupac is still alive. I mean, what's your take on that? You know, you were kind of going that direction. That seems to be where hip hop and rap changed to the gangster stuff. Is that uh, related to Tupac's death? Oh, absolutely. That same year, 1992, was the year a film named Juice was released. And Tupac, as we know, played Roland Bishop, who was the villain. And a lot of young black men took to him. Because first of all, we've seen all the girls at the movie theater going, oh my God, he's so fine. And he was just this bad boy. He was like, I don't give a fuck. That was his whole thing, right? And so a lot of boys took to that. Now, Tupac, as you know, was from, he has an interesting history. His, his mother uh, was a Black Panther. And uh, in fact, uh, I believe he was delivered in prison, if I'm not mistaken. I know she was, wow. preg I know she was pregnant in prison with him. Um, and his stepfather was also a Black Panther. So you can imagine the type of pride he must have had growing up, you know, growing up, knowing that his parents were part of something uh, such a, a important piece of African-American history. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, his mother later on got hooked on drugs. And, uh, you know, so he didn't have the happiest childhood. But this would show why there's a dichotomy in his music when it comes to women. On one song, he'd be telling girls to keep their heads up. And on the next song, he's telling he's calling them bitches and telling them to suck his dick. I hope I can cuss on here. Absolutely. Okay. It's encouraged. <laughs> OK. Right. So that that explains that dichotomy, because that's the mother uh, influence that, that he grew up with. You know, there's no telling what he saw his mother do uh, while she was high on, on, on crack. Anyway, he decides to become a rapper. He was a rapper before he was in the film uh, Juice. Uh, you know, he, he started touring with uh, Digital Underground as a backup dancer, believe it or not. He got his first verse on one of their tracks, and he decided to pursue his own career. Now, at the same time, Interscope Records was a brand new startup. Uh, interestingly, started up by, I cannot remember this guy's first name, but he's a... He's heir to the Marshall Fields Illuminati bloodline, <laughs> you know, Marshall stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ted Fields. That's his name. Ted Fields. Gotcha. And these guys go way back with J.P. Morgan in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they decided they want they decided they want to get into the music industry. 
And uh, they, so, you know, they wanted to get in, break into the rap game. So their first rapper that they tried was one Mark Wahlberg. Uh, at the time, he was known as Marky Mark. He's, they were like, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna capitalize on this Vanilla Ice thing. We're gonna break out the first hardcore white rapper that people are gonna take you know serious because w- Wahlberg had some problems when he was a kid. You know, I mean, th- th- he was he was a thug around Boston. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but <clears throat> the hip hop community wasn't ready to believe in him, so they needed something else. That's when they got Tupac. Uh, of course, Tupac got caught up in some uh, some trouble. Um, he um, he was shot. He had nothing to do with Death Row Records in in the beginning. He was he was a solo artist, and Death Row Records were trying to get him. You know, they had Dr. Dre, they had uh, DOC, they had like all these other luminaries in the gangster rap world. Then you had this guy Tupac, who was the perfect package. You know, he, he was good looking. The women loved him. Uh, he had the street credibility. He was crazy. You know, uh, they wanted him, but he wasn't ready to go over there. He was still doing his thing in New York and on the West Coast solo. Uh, then he ends up getting shot. Then he get, ends up getting convicted. And somehow, Suge Knight is able to go spring him out of prison like nothing. You know, uh, I mean, how many people do you know <laughs> that right. just go spring somebody out of prison? But that was uh, reportedly that was only on the condition that he came and signed to death row. As soon as he gets out of prison, he creates all eyes on me, which goes quadruple platinum and he's locked in. Um, but you'll notice all eyes on me. Cause if you listen to Tupac's earlier stuff, when he was doing his solo thing, although there was a gangster vibe in there, he had a lot of black empowerment songs. He had a lot of female empowerment songs. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, if you listen to his work at Death Row, there's none of that. It's all gangster. Now he would slip little seeds in there where you could tell that his this guy, you know, his his intelligence was much higher than many of his peers. But um, there wasn't too much of that black empowerment. In fact, there wasn't any black empowerment, and there wasn't too much uplifting stuff for young women in there. It was all gangster. It was all women of bitches, this, that, and the other, and. Yeah, I don't know the true story, but some say that Pac was ready to leave, that that he, he owed Death Row one more album and he was going to go do his own thing. And that's when he was murdered. Yeah, it has to be about money. Always is. Yeah. You know, and I live in Vegas. So it, it, even if you look at the actual murder, it doesn't make sense. Um, first of all, this happened on fight night, a, a Mike Tyson fight night. This was Tyson's first fight when he got out of prison. So the whole world was watching this thing. Vegas was packed. Tupac was um, driving down Flamingo Avenue, heading towards uh, Suge's Club 662. They stopped at a light on Colvo and Flamingo, which is a block away from the the strip. It wasn't that late, so there still had to be tons of people in the area just walking around, cruising, driving. Um, And reportedly, they stopped at a light. They were at the front of a seven-car entourage or something like that. Uh, A carload of girls pull up and and, and distract them, and they start talking to them, and they're flirting. Suddenly, this white Cadillac pulls up. The gunmen get out and start shooting. No one ever mentions this carload of girls. Mm. No one's ever questioned them. No one's ever talked to them. Suge reportedly, uh, you know, out of fear, drives off. He turns off and he's trying to get Pac to the hospital, but his car is all shot up. So he drives back to the Las Vegas Strip. Now, Suge would know better than anybody had he just kept straight where his club was right across the street from his club. Right across the street and down the block a little bit, there's a hospital right there. Why Mm. not take Pac there? Why would you try to go get back on the freeway to go to UMC when you know you're going to deal with traffic because it's fight night? Uh, There's so many things wrong (laughs) with this story that it's just crazy. But I do believe Pac is dead. I don't believe he's living in Cuba or nothing, but (laughs) I I do believe he's dead. Yeah, it's, it's so much easier just to kill someone. But in such a bold fashion, getting out of a car like a crazy Scorsese movie and just lighting up a car. Yeah, uh, he fits right into what I was talking about. Again, he was, you know, he's from a, a family of Black Panthers. If you listen to his solo music before he joined Death Row, he had a lot of black empowerment songs, a lot of fight the power songs. 
Uh, the last thing they needed was him to go off on his own and use that platform to put more music out, you know, uh, because I think that's what he would have done. I mean, if Pac would have still been alive, he'd be a, 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 I have no doubt he'd be an Academy Award winning actor. He'd be a social activist and um, his music would have changed. Uh, he, he would have went right back to his black empowerment music. And that is something that the, uh, the federal government doesn't want. Right. You can't have that. But was anyone ever charged with his murder? Nope. Not, yeah, see, not it's another all. another common theme. That's another common thing with these uh these high profile shootings of these high profile killings of people. Is a lot of times some no, someone gets away or no one really goes to jail. Even uh even Kennedy, uh you know he was mm-hmm. the guy who apparently killed him was was then shot in custody of the police. It just seems like something you would do if you were from behind the scenes trying to cover up the whole situation. You know, it's it's weird. Absolutely. We have cop, yeah. cops out there for a reason. They can't catch these biggest high-profile murders. Well, it's much easier when, you, when you're talking about a Tupac or a Biggie because of their lyrics. Their, their lyrics reflected violent lifestyle. So the average person would look, well, hey, you know, they rapped about that stuff, and obviously they were living that way. So it's the inevitable end. You know, so it's much easier to sweep that under the rug. No one's not no one's going to ask too many questions except for the hip hop fans. And, you know, that that's it. But I, I, I'll give you another interesting coincidence. Um, do you know who Tupac was dating at the time he was murdered? I don't. OK, he was uh, leaving the Luxor Hotel. His girlfriend stayed behind and she said she would meet him at the club later. Uh, her name was Kadada Jones. She is the daughter of Quincy Jones. Biggie. Do you know where Biggie was leaving the night he got shot? No. He was leaving a Vibe magazine party, a magazine that was founded by one Quincy Jones. Now, I'm not saying that Quincy had anything to do with it. I'm just drawing the ironic conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is a, an interesting connection. Is there anything else odd about, about Biggie's death? Do you think he was just another case uh, similar to Tupac as he was going to be an enlightening, empowering figure so they just capped him? No, I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, there's so many conspiracy. The thing is, when we talk about these, and this is one of the another one of the reasons why Jupiter 3 has yet to be released. Because when we talk about these these um, conspiracy theories, we have to name drop people who are still alive and people who are still working. Um, there's so many strange um coincidences involving Pac and Biggie's deaths. And there's some pretty big players. Now, before I started doing my podcast, I was involved in the entertainment community. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors was actually one of the original founders of Death Row Records. So I know a little bit more than your average person when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just sitting at this guy's house, um, I would hear some stuff about some of the biggest artists in the world that I was like, no way, (laughs) no way. And, you know, I I don't want to disclose them here uh, because, again, these these are people who are close to me. uh, And a lot of these people are still working. They're still in the public eye. And I'll just say that Biggie died for different reasons than Pac did. All right. Yeah, you got to be careful, man, because. Uh, another person who might have talked too much was Cat Williams. You know, it seemed like he got kind of eaten up by the Illuminati machine and spit back out. Because in one of his yeah. big specials, he was talking about going to like elite Hollywood parties and seeing famous male celebrities making out and shit. And it seemed like they didn't like him talking that way, and they ruined his reputation. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. They they took him out uh, because that 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 I will testify to that that I will tell you firsthand happens. Um, when when um, back in the 90s, I, I was a comic book artist. That's where I first started. And I was uh, I was interviewed for Source magazine, which at the time was the top hip hop magazine. And I made friends with a few of the writers there. Now, this is mid 90s, early to mid 90s. And one of the writers was living in Chicago. Uh, we, you know, we kept a, a good rapport with each other and he would tell me things about certain celebrities that I just wasn't buying. And I'll tell you, one of the the things he told me was that R. Kelly had a penchant for young girls. 
And I was like, get mm. out of here. He's like, yeah, he does. He's like, he goes up to school and picks them up. He pays their families off. You know, and it, it was like no big deal. So when and he, he, he also tell me about other big names in the industry and stuff that they're into. And I'm just like, get out of here. No way. Of course, this guy was in a position to know, but I just wasn't believing it. And it wasn't until the R. Kelly story broke, you know, where he had the, the sex tape and everything that I was like, wow. You know, how much of the other stuff did this guy tell me was true? <laughs> you know, so then years later, when I entered the entertainment community, uh, a lot of the things that this guy had told me and much more were absolutely um, uh, validated. You know, so, yeah, Cat Williams, um, when, when you decide to join that machine, when, when you decide to work the re- walk the red carpet, which represents the bloodline of secrecy, uh, you have to take with it uh, the secrecy. You, you have to keep those secrets to yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a violation that he broke. You know, I mean, that's a rule that he broke. You know, so, yeah, you won't be seeing much of him. Not on the <laughs> mainstream. Yeah, it's it's so weird how it happens. You know, I, I watched it happen. I was a huge Cat Williams fan. I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy in general. So uh, to see his spiraling into madness, it, it, it was a little little weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, that's, he's not the only one that's happened to. That's happened to quite a few, from your Dave Chappelle's to your, you know, because when you're when you're when you're mili- militant minded, all right, when you grow up, uh, you know, with parents similar to mine, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. who would always tell you like, don't trust this, don't trust that, and they, they would, you know, you know, point out the proven conspiracies in history. Uh, you already have that original programming. So then when you try to go into the entertainment industry and you just see the hypocrisy and the sickness within, it's, it's very hard to keep it to yourself. It's right. very hard to deal with it when you see what's going on. You know, so uh, th- that's why, you know, the, the only people who make it there, you better believe that, that they're shutting their mouth about a lot of stuff. The only people who make it there and stay there. You know, Michael Jackson, he started breaking down towards the end, so they had to get rid of him. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation about Michael Jackson, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he, he was he – was, Michael was getting ready to be back on top of the world again, right? And, and right, I don't know if you've seen some of these interviews and some of these speeches he was giving uh, before – you know, shortly before he passed, but he was saying some pretty explosive things about a lot of people in the, in the industry. Mm-hmm. And, and so they were like, yeah, we got to get rid of this guy. <laughs> See, well, that begs an interesting question because why kill some and then just bury the careers of others? Because it seems like leaving a loose end. You know, I was a big Breaking Bad fan. I loved Mike, the cleaner guy. He didn't leave loose ends. And for the Illuminati to just let Cat Williams still exist, it's like, you know, well, now he's got nothing to lose. Okay, well, if I was Cat Williams, I wouldn't worry about dying unless. I was on the verge of making another comeback. The first thing they will do is they will destroy your character. That's what they did to Michael. If you look at the uh, the testimony against him, you you'll wonder why he even paid those people off, like for you know the the molestation allegations, mm-hmm. uh, because the, the they were they were so ridiculous. The claims were so ridiculous, and and the the uh, the the evidence was so flimsy. He just paid them off because he was like, you know, I'm sick of dealing with this, and you know. He didn't have anybody around him to tell him, like, that's not a good idea, dude. (laughs) You know, so he went Mm -hmm. through it again and again. They tried to destroy him twice, both of which he ducked. Then, you know, they destroyed his record career by not promoting his albums and whatnot, hoping that he would just disappear and, and, you know, go away in his drug haze. But he's getting ready to do This Is It, which would have been the biggest concert tour on the planet and he would have been given a spotlight again, and they couldn't have that, you know. Um, there's a reason why Dave Chappelle hasn't tried to come back, you know. Right. Uh, Dave Chappelle, by, in theory, Dave Chappelle can walk into, and still to this day, he can walk into any network and say, hey, listen, I want to do a show. And mm-hmm. they, uh, the network would be a fool not to take him, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. You know, he's still doing stand up, you know, here, there and wherever. But he's not doing any television, any films. And there's a reason for that. That's when he has to worry. You know, so yeah. they try to destroy you first by saying that you're crazy or that you're gay or that you're well, gay doesn't even work anymore. Uh, that you're home, that you're a, a, a child molester or whatever. And if that fails 
or if they just cannot find any dirt on you, then they'll kill you. Mm-hmm. You'll notice uh, it, if we go back to the uh, if we go back to uh, the '60s. Um, the reason why Martin Luther King outlived Malcolm X is because the FBI had dirt on Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was a philanderer. He was cheating on his wife. Mm-hmm. And they tried to blackmail him with it and, you know, this, that, and the other. Only then did they kill him when they seen they had nothing else on him. Malcolm was flawless. Like, he had nothing on his record. Um, they, they, they made recordings, which you can find on YouTube, of the FBI trying to turn him against... Uh, the nation of Islam once he left and uh, he just wouldn't give him anything. So it's like, all right, we just got to kill him, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, if they, if they'll try to destroy you reputation wise first. And if they can't do that, then, then they'll kill you. And, and if you really want to see it in writing, look up the COINTELPRO document. Uh, COINTELPRO, as you know, was an FBI um, move to, um, bring down black leaders like any any black person who looked like that they were getting ready to lead this uprising that the fbi fears so much there's a a step-by-step tutorial on how you are to break them down and they in there they have you know destroy his reputation say that he's homosexual say this say that start fights between him and his crew and if all else fails just kill him you know so yeah Yeah. Uh, cat williams don't have nothing to worry about unless he makes a big comeback (laughs) I mean, Malcolm X has one of my favorite quotes of all time where he says, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing, which is exactly what we see today. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, We we definitely see it. Um, In the black community, one of our biggest problems is our allowing our young people to embrace this music that they do. Mm -hmm. Because the music basically, you know, they're seeing these rappers – they're seeing the videos with all the girls. They're seeing them with all the, the platinum chains and the cars. So that's success. I, I, any American, any person on the planet would see that as success if you have all these nice things and you're surrounded by all this beauty. Um, but when you have these rappers who say, hey, I sold drugs, I shot people, I went to prison for a minute, then I get out and I'm a rapper, these kids say, hey, that's the way, that's the path to cut." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, well, I got to kill some people and then I get the record deal because then I got the credit. Ninety percent of them are going to end up in prison or dead trying to get there. You know, so um, our problem here now is that we have embraced the beast. You know, in fact, if if you speak out against it, if you talk about how how, how terrible this music is, you know, they call you a sellout in Uncle Tom or something like that. But it's um, definitely definitely being controlled somewhere mm-hmm. and for some reason it's interesting i mean i've i've definitely thought about it before you know when i was talking to professor griff that's why he's get, getting back out there and doing music you yeah. know it, he's trying to be more enlightening to kind of turn the tide on this thing because we're like two decades in to this kind of uh, manipulation and yeah. i guess what would you say what's your analysis on on the current state of black culture. I mean, are, are they seem to be waking up to this because now this music is being given to people like Katy Perry and Lady Gaga, which is weird. Well, that's uh, that 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 again is another. Uh, here's the thing about okay, if you look at popular music, all forms of today's popular music, most of it, ninety percent of it, was created right here in America uh, with African American roots, and this goes back to blues, country, gospel, you know, all of that, mm-hmm. right? What what we do as a people is is we view you know we're too flighty you know we'll 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 start something we'll make it popular and then we just abandon it <laughs> you know mm-hmm. we saw this with break dancing break dancing was a black enterprise at one time now it's uh, you go to a break dance cipher it's going to be mostly Asian and Latino kids um, say so we did the same thing with graffiti we did the same thing with uh, so many different art forms and um, we did with rock and roll. Like if you think of rock, you don't think of Chuck Berry and, and little Richard and these guys who created the art form. You think of big hair, eighties bands. You think of, you know, mm-hmm. tool or something like that because black people in this country, um, they abandon stuff. They create stuff. They'll enjoy it. And then they get tired of it and they abandon it. Then they complain <laughs> when white people start doing it and they say, Oh, they're trying to steal our culture. It's like, no, you gave it away right now. Uh, we are in the process of giving away R&B. 
<laughs> We're giving away R&B, and this is proof positive if you just look at the last Billboard Awards. Uh, no black artist won. Really? <laughs> you know, Justin Timberlake won the top award. Uh, I believe uh, Robin Thicke, uh, Justin Bieber may have even won one. Huh. Uh, and the only black performer they had up there was Pharrell, because he's the only one who made an R&B song that was happy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And Michael Jackson, who's dead. <laughs> you know, right. and we're in the process of giving it away right now. We don't re recognize it because most of our R&B artists today are running around trying to be like rappers. You got Chris Brown, who easily could have uh, taken the throne from Michael Jackson, you know, once Michael Jackson passed because he has the talent. He has the you know, he could dance. He could do all that.